We're now come to the book of St. John. And in the book of St. John, you will find again that there are two angels spoken of during the course of Jesus' resurrection. Now, on last week, we tried to recap some of part one, part two, part three, where we spoke of the book of St. Matthews, I spoke on the book of St. Matthews, St. Mark, and St. Luke. And when we arrived at St. Luke, we were at part four and at part three. And during the discussion of St. Luke, we cut it into two parts, part three and part four. Because at St. Luke is our first encounter, or at St. Luke, we encounter two angels. And that's the first time that in the writings here of the Bible, as we read through it, studying the, about the resurrection of Jesus, we see two angels. Prior to the book of St. Luke, we did not see two angels. Ah working towards the resurrection of Jesus. We sought patiently to explain in part three and in part four the need for the second angel. And in part four we sought to answer the, a question for you. Who was the second angel? Already we had defined the first angel. By analogy, we concluded that that first angel represents our Savior, Master Farad Muhammad. We see that that first angel is spoken of in St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, and again, that first angel is also in the book of St. John. So again, we know who one of these angels are that is consistent throughout all of the books. St. Mark, St. Matthew, St. Luke, and St. John. In the book of St. Luke, we see the coming of a second angel. In the book of St. John, we see that second angel still present. In part four, we talked about what he did. Rather than telling you uh, who he is, we said, what did he do? And hopefully by pointing to what he did, you might be able to draw some conclusion as to who he is. Now I want to take my time and be with you for a while in this area to try and clear up some moments that you might not have, stu have understood last week. Rather than to tell you last week in part four who this second angel is, 
we instead sought to tell you what he did. And in telling you what he did, we used certain words which may have confused some of you. We said to you that he came talking about truth. And the use of that phrase about truth may have disturbed some of you or set your thinking in a direction which I did not intend it go. Rather than use the term teaching about truth, we'll choose to use the term that he came explaining the truth and telling the people what truth is. Now that's essentially what we meant last week when we said about truth. That this particular angel came teaching, explaining what truth is. Teaching concerning the truth itself. Whereas prior to that angel, what you had been receiving is the truth. You've been taught the truth. The truth is that the Bible is a prophecy, a prophetical picture of your history. That is the truth. It is the truth that you are lost here in America. That is the truth. It is the truth that you are a slave here in America. That is the truth. It is the truth that there is little unity, little harmony, absolutely or hardly any trust amid our people. That is the truth. But now this particular angel, this second angel, came teaching you about truth, concerning truth, what truth itself is. Now just before I move inside of this lecture, part five, with the voice I intend to bring it in. I want to go back for a moment to that angel and draw his identification a little bit closer to you. Now, as I've explained to you before, that there are many writers who write the Bible are publishing houses that publish the Bible. I have several different Bibles myself. And some of those Bibles through cross-references it will help you to find the points that you are looking for or help you to verify that which you believe. In other of those Bibles, the references are not clear. They do not direct you. So you are left to guess. Now we see in the book of St. Matthews in part one that that first angel descended from heaven. Now that's made plain. The book itself states that. And we match that with the coming of our Savior, Master Farad Muhammad, from the east, from the holy city Mecca. Now here in the book of St. John, we see a second angel. And we see that second angel also present in the book of St. Luke. But we do not see in St. Luke or in St. John where 
that angel descended from. We don't have the Bible telling us where he came from. Now we have the Bible telling us that that first angel descended out of heaven. Yes, sir. But the Bible does not point you to the coming of that second angel and from what place has he come. Thus, the theologians, the teachers, the imams, are left only to guess about where he came from. And at most, that's the best they could do, is guess. Because the Bible does not specifically say where that second angel came from. Now, I will assure you that your guess can be just as effective as can the preachers or the imams or the reverends or the pope. That's all he is doing is guessing about where that angel came from. Because the Bible does not say where the angel, that second angel in St. Luke and in St. John came from. We know the first one descended out of heaven. Our concern today is where did that second one come from? Now since the Pope, since the Imam, since the preachers can guess and you can guess, then I can make a guess also. Now rather than guess, I've done a little work which I encourage you to do. I've done my research because I'm concerned about explaining the truth to you and showing you where you can find the truth to back up what you say. So I'm not going to just guess at about where he's from. I'm going to use the Bible to show you who might he be. And from that point, you may use your own mind to guess. But when you take a look at Saint John, looking at that second angel, in the Cambridge Bible, you won't see a reference directing you to where else he might be found. When you take a look at that second angel, in other Bibles, Schofield for an example, you will see a reference directing you to the angel, but again all it says is an angel. It doesn't say who that angel is or where that angel has come from. Now that's our concern. At least we leave our people in confusion. And it is my hope that we learn to cooperate with one another and establish a united nation among blacks people here in America and throughout all Africa. So I'm particularly concerned that you understand what I speak as opposed to becoming carried away in the spirit. St. John, either in the Schofield Bible or in Cambridge, does not take you to a reference at other parts of the Bible where you might focus in specifically on who that second angel is. So we take a look backward at St. Luke and see whether or not St. Luke, 
since that same angel that's spoken of in St. John is that angel in St. Luke, that second angel, we will see if St. Luke point us to a reference that we can draw an identity of that angel. St. Luke would direct you to, by reference, the book of Acts and a particular chapter in Acts. The book of Acts, in turn, will direct you to the book of Joshua concerning that second angel. Now in the book of Joshua, that's where we are, looking for that second angel. We have gone from St. Luke, and we're using the Cambridge Bible, since it's the only Bible that I have been able to find thus far of the many I have, including Schofield, that points you to the identity or what possibly may be the identity of that second angel that's down there in Jesus' grave, assisting the first angel to resurrect Jesus. St. Luke takes you to the book of Acts. The book of Acts takes you to Joshua. Joshua 5, 13. And in Joshua 5, 13, it reads, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him, and said unto him, Art thou for us, or for our adversaries? Verse 14. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship, and said unto him, What says my Lord unto his servant? Here Joshua has now bowed himself to his Lord and asked, What saith my Lord? First, Joshua has already stood up to do something. You see that, right? Yes, sir. Because no one else is at this time doing anything. Now when Joshua stood up to do something because no one else was doing anything, to help this people, Joshua took it upon himself to stand up. And when Joshua took it upon himself to stand up, he saw an angel. And this angel, he thought, why aren't you helping? Joshua may have been asking him. Are you with us or are you one of our adversaries? Why have you allowed these things to happen? Are you with them or are you with us? That was Joshua's question. For I, Joshua, have come to help the people. If you don't, now tell me, who are you and what are you? Are you with us or against us? That was Joshua talking to this man he saw. And this man said to Joshua, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua at that time fell on his face on the earth and did worship this man that he saw and said unto him, What saith the Lord? Well, what do you want me to do? That's what Joshua now is saying to this man. And the captain of the host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest 
is holy. And Joshua did so. Now at most, any preacher, any imam, any pope, at best, can only conclude that that second angel in the tomb, with, in Jesus' tomb, in the book of St. Luke, and in the book of St. John, would have to be that Joshua. Since we don't have no other place to point to, either in St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, or St. John, which shows where that angel came from, then that angel who is down there in Jesus' tomb must have already been down there dead like Jesus himself. Yes, For we do know that Joshua, before he stood up to help the people, he too had on what? Dirty garments. Yes, sir. Do you recall? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm just trying to get you to see now that second angel. Now last week rather than use the Bible to point to him I told you what he did. And those of you who have done any studying of the Bible, you already know that the word Joshua, when translated, means Savior. Yes, sir. Or to save. You already know that, don't you? Yes, sir. Those of you who have done any studying already know that when Moses went up to the mountain, he didn't come back. That it was Joshua who came down. Those of you who have already studied the Bible, you know that it was Joshua who took the people on into the land flowing with milk and honey. It was not Moses. So now you draw your conclusion. Your guess might be a little bit better than the preachers now. Yes, might be a little bit better than the imams yes, or the popes. Since you have some references here in the Bible to back up that which you believe. And they do not. What did this angel do? Or, if you want us to go on and say it now, since we know in our minds who he is, we can call him Joshua, if you want to. What did he do? Now we know he took the people into the promised land. We know that. But there is something that he had to do before the people could go into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. For had the people gone into the promised land behaving as they were behaving under Moses, the promised land would not have been a promised land, it would have been another hell. So Joshua had a work to do with the people before he could take them on over into the land. Now the people had already stood up under Moses. They were already walking on their feet. Let me take you back with just a bit. Under the honorable Elijah Muhammad, peace be upon him. Muslims were walking like Muslims, weren't they? Yes, they looked good, didn't they? Yes, they did. 
But there was still something wrong with the Muslim's head. What? The Muslim was still saying, Allah, Allah, looking out into the clouds, wasn't he? Everything he would get ready to do, he would say, Inshallah, wouldn't he? That I'll do good if it's the will of Allah. I'll do this if it's the will of Allah. I'll do such and such if it's the will of Allah. That Muslim, honor the honorable Elijah Muhammad, peace be upon him, had not yet learned what a Muslim is. Though he was walking like a Muslim, he was up on his feet, but there was still something wrong in his head. There was still something not right with his head. Yes, he was looking like a Muslim, dressed in a suit and tie, but when the sun go down, he drop a benny. <laughs> or he'd take a red devil. Or he'd have a sip of beer. He might even fornicate or commit adultery. He was standing up. When you saw him, you saw a Muslim. But when wife saw him, he and wife were still in the grave. When friend saw him, him and friend, or he and friend, were still living the grave life. But when you saw him, he was walking, looking like a Muslim. Thinking, making you to believe he's a Muslim. And the sister, do you remember her? In a long white flowing garment. <laughs> Big white scarf wrapped around her head. And when you'd see her, she'd walk like she's gliding on ice. <laughs> In the temple. But when you'd get her home and pull that white rag off her head, you'd see her hair nappy and unwashed. And you'd hear her complaining, fussing, badly about how I hate to have this thing on my head. <laughs> Didn't you do that? Oh, something was wrong with the head. The Muslims were standing upon the feet, but something was wrong with the head. The head wasn't right, was it? Now, Joshua can't take you nowhere until your head get right, can he? Now, maybe that's the reason why St. Luke and St. John found a need for a second angel. And since that angel did not descend from heaven, he must have come out of the hell, out of the grave, and know what the people know, have been through what they've been through. So we see in the book of Joshua that Joshua had on filter garments before he was made clean. So he knows what you know. Everything you know, and some things you don't know. He went through it through too. The other Muslim also gave life, gave hope, and gave spirit to the whole black community, didn't he? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We've already talked about that many mayors, beginning at about 1967, how those mayors, black mayors, began to enter into the arena of politics and gain those seats as mayors in the city. 103 there were, about 1975. We've talked about that. And we've told you that they were there as a result of the spirit in the black community. And we've already gone over the fact that that spirit was in the black community because of the Muslims. We won't have no fight with anyone over that. For we can look back at Nat Turner, can't we? And we don't see black males when Nat Turner was on his rampage. We don't see people talking about a nation during Nat Turner's reign. 
and after Nat Turner's death, do we? Harriet Tubman. She did a great work, didn't she? Yes, sir. An honorable black woman, isn't she? Yes, sir. But during the reign of Harriet Tubman and all her works, we don't see black people talking about a black nation. And we don't see that taking place after her death, do we? Yes. Frederick Douglass. Now that's my favorite. Oh, I admire him. A little bit more than I do all the rest, but that's my preference. You've got a right to your own. But even Frederick Douglass, during the time of his speeches, we don't hear black people talking about a black nation. And after his death, we don't see black people talking about a black nation. Do we? Around about 1910, we had an uprise of Booker T. Washington and his adversary, W.E. Du Bois. During their long, heated debates, you didn't hear black people talking about a black nation before, during, or after their death. Between about 1916, 1924, you had Marcus Garvey. And he did take a few blacks over to Africa. But after his death, you didn't hear black people talking about a black nation. Around about 1925 to about 1929, you had Oscar Brown Sr. Note the times now. From about 1925 to about 1925, 29. Short run. Oscar Brown Sr. Yes, I'm talking about Oscar Brown Jr.'s father. He was talking black talk. But during his life, you didn't see black people talking about black nation. And after his death, you didn't hear them talking about a black nation. But in 1930, a man came, Master Farad Muhammad, out of Mecca, what is known as the Holy City once called heaven. That man, W.F. Muhammad, he started teaching black people. And when he started teaching black people, you saw black people stand up and start talking about a black nation. didn't you? Yes, sir. You saw black people standing up on their feet. Bold, strong, speaking out against the Caucasian race, didn't you? Talking about we've got a right to a government and a nation of our own. Yes, After he left, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad stood up, still in the interim between 1933 and a half and 1936. Black people in the United States were still talking about a black nation. Quiet, low, very few but they were still talking. But that's the way any child is born, isn't it? First there's a sperm, then a blood clot. It's right there in the Quran. We'll get to it sometime. Then a fetus, then a child. Nations are born the same way. During the lifetime, the rain, of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you saw black people talking about a black nation, about a black government, didn't you? 
even after the death of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you saw black people talking about a black nation, a black government, didn't you? Not only that, you saw black people who had never ever been in the temple changing their names to Kareem and other such like Arabic names, didn't you? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, peace be upon him, and our Savior, Master Farad Muhammad. Praises are due to him forever and ever. They had a tremendous impact upon this wilderness of North America. Whether our people want to accept it or not, that they cannot deny. That the impact of those two men upon this United States of America has been so tremendous that it has shaped every black man and woman throughout America. And that shaking was brought about through by the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. They stood up. Do you remember, brother? Yes, Looking like a Muslim. Do you remember, brother? Yes, but they still could not stay away from the tavern. Do you remember, brother? Yes, the whiskey still had a taste that they longed for. The reefer still had a taste that they longed for. Sisters passed by them and they couldn't keep the head straight. They were looking like Muslims. They were standing up like Muslims. I wonder if Joshua was there too. <laughs> Since he didn't ascend from heaven, he must have been there with the people when Moses was raising them up. For in the Bible we see God talking to Moses, sending Moses out to tell the people. We see Moses giving Joshua some of his honor bestowed upon him an honor. That's in the book of Joshua and in the book of Deuteronomy. You can find it. What kind of honor can Moses have bestowed upon Joshua? What would be the greatest honor that Moses can have bestowed upon Joshua? Do you think he would say, you are my minister? That would be unique, would it? There was a lot of ministers. Moses apparently gave to Joshua some other kind of honor. Now, you and I, we can guess about it, can't we? Yes, sir. So let's guess. <laughs> but now what would Joshua if he is in fact that angel in your mind in the book of St. John, what would he be doing? Well, I've looked back at old Joshua because I believe that second angel in the book of St. John and in the book of St. Luke to be Joshua. And since I believe that angel to be Joshua, I look back at old Joshua to see what Joshua was going through at the time that Moses was here. Peace be upon him. Now when I say Moses, you know that I mean the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Peace be upon him. What was Joshua doing at that time? What was his thing? What kind of honor did Moses bestow upon him? 
What was he thinking about? And if Joshua was here today, after the death of Moses, peace be upon him, what would he be doing? What would he be saying? Last week I told you that I had done a little research and I brought forward to you that research which I had done. And I left you, some of you, in awe. So I've come back again today to explain what Joshua was doing or what Joshua did. Concluding already that that angel in St. Luke, that that angel in St. John is the person, Joshua. This man, Joshua, when he stood up after the death of Moses to carry the people on into the land, he knew that he could not carry them over there the way they were. He knew that they were standing up on their feet but he knew that something was still wrong in their heads. That something was still not right with their thinking. That they were not too far removed or far removed from the same kind of thought pattern that they were in when they were Christians. So he knew that he couldn't take them on like that so he had to give them something to straighten their heads out. So that's why I said to you last week that Joshua, when he came to the people, he came teaching them about truth. And rather than to have used that term, about truth, it may have been better for your understanding had I used the word he came explaining to the people what truth is. He did not just tell the people the truth. He explained to the people that the truth lives within them. That it is a lie concerning the truth. The very thought, even. It sounds as like truth itself is an existence. That truth is a life form. Here. Here is that angel in St. John. He is one who taught the people, explaining truth, saying to them as he began. Rather than move directly to truth itself, as he spoke, he began to draw their attention back to themselves that they may recount their own past doings so that they could take a look at self. And then he pointed out to them that if all of your wrongdoings were brought to light. He knew that even while a Muslim and before becoming a Muslim and after becoming a Muslim and after the Honorable Elijah Muhammad died and you passed away back to sleep, the wrong that you had done 
the many ills, the many evils which you committed against your very selves. He knew that. Thus he raised the question, if all of your wrongdoings were brought to light, and he stopped, and he thought on it, wondering what would be the results. For having known self and the fall he had taken, oh Joshua, and the things and the wrongs he had done, even with some of you, he imagined that if all of your wrongdoings, just you, were brought to light, what a commotion that would be right here in your midst. Let me repeat it. He referred to it as like there would be turbulence amid you. Riots. It seemed in his mind that utter darkness would appear in the earth. Because of the wrongs that you've done, that you yourself wrongs, collectively were brought to light. What a dreadful day would there be in this earth. Think on it. What do you think about it? Just knowing yourself. What you've been through. The wrongs that you have done. And your wrongs coupled with the wrongs of brother, the wrongs of sister. What kind of trust would there be amid you? What kind of righteousness would there be? What kind of harmony would there be? What kind of peace would there be if these things were brought to light? You, here with me, followers, what trust would there be amid you? What trust would the one of you have for the other? If right now, this very instance, you knew the many wrongs that brother sitting right next to you have done, the many wrongs that sister sitting right in front of you or in the back of you have done. Could there be trust with you? Could there be peace with you? Could there be unity with you? Could there be harmony of minds with you? Trust. He thought on it. This angel in St. John. And he called out, O oh man, it is the iron link which bonds you together. The one of you to the other. That the crave for the bond between you, that it becomes like unto an iron link, unbreakable. But the only way that that can come about, that iron, unbreakable link, between you is that you start to trust one another. But you cannot trust one another until you start to speak truth, pure, clear truth to one another. And you cannot speak clear, pure truth to one another until you have done right. For you, within yourself, he said, are broken into pieces. Many little pieces. For you even do not as yet trust yourself. He went on to explain that you, you cannot go home and be content or have peace with yourself not having engaged in wrong with another brother or with another sister, but just by yourself you went off alone 
and broke the law against you. So you are broken up inside. You are at disunity inside. You have no peace inside. For you know the wrong that you've done alone by yourself against you. Ashamed are you of the wrongs which you know you've done. If you are truly righteous, if you are truly truthful, if you are truly of God's family today, you are ashamed of the wrongs that you know you've done. You are ashamed of the lies you know that you've told. You are ashamed of the gossip and the backbiting and the slander that you know that you've done against sister against brother, of the tipping out and smoking reefer, drinking whiskey, committing fornication and adultery, if you are truly righteous and truthful, you would be ashamed to sit here as a Muslim at a time when Allah is present to establish you in unity and you are hanging on with that filth in you saying you're one of the righteous disturbing the peace holding back the glory of our God if you are righteous inside then you can hear me then I got a place with you and you have a place with me but if you are wrong inside and of not of God, then you can't even hear what I'm talking about. You who are righteous and have done wrong, you cannot look into your own mirror, some of you, at yourself. And in truth, with the truth in you, say, to the mirror, to the person you see in the mirror, that you trust that person. You trust that person whom you see in your mirror, and it's you. And you can't trust him. You can't trust her. How do you expect for there to be trust amongst you when you can't trust self? For you know the wrong in you. You know the lie in you. You know what evils you rough, what evils you plan, and you can't trust yourself. How can there be unity in our black nation until you come to that? You can't go home. Yes, you are standing up on your feet, looking, speaking, talking, acting like Muslim, but something is still wrong in the head. That must be gotten right. That must be straightened out. The person whom you see in your mirror, it's you. It's yourself. You cannot lie to him. Yourself. Not him, me. Not him, Silas. But you, sister. You, brother. You can't lie to you. How can you lie to yourself? I mean, yes, you can lie, but don't you know it? You still haven't lied to you. That's who I'm talking about. When I say you can't lie to him, the him is you. You cannot lie to her. That her is you. You cannot lie to her. That person to whom you speak in your mirror, that person has a knowledge of you. Then stop lying to me, he explained. And you thought that he meant for you to stop lying to me. 
No, not me. Those are just the words that Allah is speaking of you. Stop lying to me. The me is you. Allah is saying to you, you stop lying to me. The me that's inside of you. I am the man. I am the woman. I am the children hearing, observing, watching you. Every one of you is Allah. And every one of you can see the other. Every one of you know a wrong on the other. Every one of you can see the wrong that the other do can hear the lie that the other tell. For Allah is all about you, watching, seeing, and hearing. For Allah is you. You thought it was me. I'm the teacher waking you up. Oh, Jesus, resurrect yourself. I am the truth of you. Not I, Silas Muhammad, am the truth of you. But I, Allah, I, the truth in Silas, is also the truth in you. I am the truth within your midst, in your children, in your sons, in your daughters. I am that truth in them. In your midst, watching everything you do, I am the truth in you. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Nothing can you do which I cannot see. Think on it. What can you do that you yourself can't see. Not me. I'm out here in Marietta. <laughs> or Marietta. I'm not saying I can see you. I'm saying you can see you. Do you understand? Nothing can you say which I cannot hear. Which I the truth in you cannot hear. Nothing can you say that I can't hear. And that which is in you, hidden, you think. I know it also. <laughs> think on that. Can you hide from self? <clears throat> you cannot hide naught about what you do. Say, or think from yourself. You can see yourself. You know yourself. You know when you tell the truth. You know when you lie. You know when you deviate. You know when you waver. You know when you're not straight. You know when you misrepresent the facts. You know it. If you know it, Allah know it. Why? I am Allah. The truth in you, the immortal truth in you, living inside of you. Can you hear me now? Fear, and you should fear, doing wrong, least I shall see it. Least I, the truth and righteousness in you, will see the wrong you do and know. Fear telling untruths, lying, least I shall hear it. 
and know. Do you understand? Your body, it is my dwelling place. Cast out the lie. Cast out the wrong. Least I cast out your memory into utter darkness. Well, you will remember nothing except that you exist. But why, how, where, or when, you shall not know it. Not your name, even, shall you remember. And believe me, I have been there. When Allah first called on me, I refused to hear. I kept on doing what I was doing. I kept on smoking on my reefer. When the door first knocked, I looked out for someone else to stand up. And I called out, what about this minister? What about that minister? Not me. I refused to obey. And Allah knocked a second time. And that time I fell to my knees into a state of utter blackness. Utter darkness. For I had been called, but refused to quit doing wrong, refused to stop lying. And my memory was taken away, and I knew nothing except that I exist. And I cried and pain, wishing for something, memory, some memory, something. What is my name? All I could see was blackness, but my eyes were wide open. It was an awful state, worse than death a hundred times. I want not ever to be there again. I hope you can hear me. The truth, the righteousness in you has that much power in you and over you in this day and time. For this is the day of Allah. And Allah is the truth. In that state of mind, all you can do, all you can do is cry out for help. Help me, someone. Help me. And no help will come. Then you have only to call. And the only thing now you can think of to call is Allah. Allah, oh Allah, will you help me? That will be your call. Restore, please, you will be begging, my memory to me that I might know who I am. For even that has been taken away. But you will have lied. And I am the truth. You will have committed a wrong act against me. And I am that righteousness 
in you. I am thyself. I am thyself, the invisible mind existing in you. You cannot see me visually. But you can see my hull, this physical man, this physical woman. I am thyself, the self-same self, which is life within you. Do not doubt it and remain dead. Speak the truth and return to life. Concerning truth, I am of two phases as like unto the front and the back side of you. There is truth which has passed. It is the history of you, or it is an event which has happened. There is truth which is now presently unfolding in your midst, before your eyes. The prophecies which were foretold of you by the prophets before me. It is that which is unfolding in your presence now. It's the divine truth. It's life. The, the divine truth, it is you in the act fulfilling your word. It causes life in you. Fulfilling your word is perfecting yourself in truth. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, Fulfilling your word is perfecting yourself in truth. Just doing what you say you're going to do. You're perfecting you in truth. That's beautiful, isn't it? Through by perfecting yourself, you, in truth, will you learn, and only will you learn, that truth is alive and lives within the people. And when you have cast out of yourself your every wrong act, you will have destroyed your cause to lie. Does that make sense? Yes, when you stop doing wrong, when you refuse to do wrong, you won't mind speaking the truth. It's only because of the wrong in you that you know that you have done and don't want to admit to that causes you to lie. So cast out of you your every wrong act and you will have destroyed your every cause to lie. For when you have done right and know that you are right, it's so easy to speak truth. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Oh, that's so precious. It's a great day, isn't it? Yes, sir. For the righteous. Yes, sir. It's a great day. Moses told us about this day, didn't he? Yes, the spoken truth, listen to this. Listen at truth speak. 
Listen to it. Here is truth. The spoken truth is the force, the force of my righteousness. Verify, in parenthesis, evidencing the existence of myself. Isn't that something? That's my God talking. So the spoken truth is the force of my righteousness verifying, evidencing the existence of myself. You cannot see my righteousness. That's invisible. You can't see inside of me. You can't see in my house whether I've done right or wrong from this distance. But when I speak, the force of my words, if they are truthful, they will verify my righteousness. Do you understand? And the lie will verify your wrong. The force of it. Do you understand? So we know. Speak the truth. I am God. <laughs> Isn't that something? That's beautiful, isn't it? I am God. When I used to read that in the Bible, I thought there was some mystery out there talking. And the prophets was just speaking for the mystery. I know now that the prophet was saying, I, that self in me, that force of righteousness in me, I am the immortal God. Oh, that's beautiful, huh? Don't it feel good? Do you like that? I like that myself. And watch this now. And am the son of a man. <laughs> I'm going to close this book up for a while. This is my book, by the way. That's not King James Version. <laughs> That's not Muhammad Ali's version. That's not Yusuf Ali's version. That's not the Schofield's version. That's your black brother's version. Your black brother that was down in the grave with you. Doing the same thing that you did. When you lied, he lied. When you did wrong, he did wrong. The same little black brother that was a Muslim with you. Honor the honorable Elijah Muhammad. When you dropped your Benny, you gave him one. <laughs> so he knows. You can't fool him. He was with Moses. He was right there with the believers. So he know Moses and the believers. He had on dirty garments. But something was in him that Moses saw worthy enough to bestow on him some of his honor. I'm in the book of St. John, chapter 20. I'm going to read it to you the way it's written, and then I'll pause from time to time and try and make it clear some of this old English. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the place the tomb where Jesus was laid buried and seeth the stone taken away from the tomb now note those words let me pause there for a moment this is not the end of the Sabbath as said old St. Matthew's that this angel is coming. Yes, sir. That's right. This is not 
after the Sabbath has passed, as said St. Mark. But this is St. John saying now, the first day of the week. Now we've already explained to you that when we said the Sabbath, we're talking about the old world having gone away. That old world's power having been broken. And the beginning or the commencement of a new world started upon the coming of our Savior. But yet, it was dark, for the mind had not yet received truth and know it. That's why St. John say, on the first day of the week, yes, it is the beginning of a new world. Isn't it? Yes, sir. And the new world began upon the coming of our Savior. But you only stood up. Your mind was still dark. It wasn't clear yet, was it? Because even in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's book, Message to the Black Man, you are just now beginning to understand what he said. Aren't you? Yes, sir. Just now. So St. John say, Mary cometh early when it was still dark. Do you understand? Yes, sir. The prophets are just talking to the prophets. That's all they're talking to. They wasn't talking to all the people. They're just talking to the prophets for the prophets to deliver the message to the people. I believe my people are becoming aware of that today. And if you go ahead and do what God in you wants for you to do, they will know that Joshua is here. Verse 2. Then she runneth. That's that old English. All she did was just run. Okay? <laughs> and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the... I'm going to call this word tomb. It's spelled in the book. S-E-P-U-L-C-H-R-E. Now, you might have your own pronunciation for that. I've got mine, so I'm going to keep mine to myself and call it tomb. We're just talking about Jesus' grave, all right? We all don't speak the same English. See, I'm from Texas. <laughs> and I'd say it the way the Texas people say it. <laughs> and you might be from New York. <laughs> Now this man that's running with Peter, or that's with Peter, that Mary, wait a minute, wait just one second. Now, I've already told you that we're in part five of the resurrection of Jesus. And I have told you that part six, we're going to talk about Mary, didn't I? I told you that at the beginning. But let's just pause right here for just a few moments so that you can do a little thinking over the week before we get back next week about Mary. Don't you find it rather strange that Mary is always there? Through every one of these books, through St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, and St. John, Mary is always on her way to that tomb. It's always Mary, isn't it? St. Luke and St. John, Mary is always on her way to that tomb. It's always Mary, isn't it? What's with Mary? I mean, why is Mary so in love with Jesus? We'll take that up next week, but you think about it over the week, all right? But now Mary, <coughs> she runs to tell Peter 
and that other disciple whom Jesus loved. And for your information, if you don't feel like digging it up yourself, that other disciple whom Jesus loved was John. Now that was in verse 2. Verse 3. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple came to the tomb. So they ran both together. And the other disciple, old John, did outrun Peter. Now that has a meaning. We'll get to it somewhere down the line. And came first to Jesus' tomb. And he, John, the one who outrun Peter, stooping down at verse 5, and looking in, saw the linen cloth lie. John now, when he stooped down and looked in, he saw the linen cloth lying. But he didn't go in. At verse 6. Then cometh Simon Peter, Simon Peter, following him, and went into the tomb, and seeth the linen cloth lie. Now that's important. Both of these two men, both John and Peter, have seen the linen cloth line. This linen cloth that Jesus had once been wrapped in, it's now being seen. But Jesus at this time is not in it. Where else in the book does the book talk about the linen cloth? In St. Luke. They saw the linen cloth. Now note, they saw the linen cloth that he had been wrapped in. It was lying. But at verse 7, now watch. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but wrapped together in a place by itself. That's important. This is the first time throughout the whole four books that any of these writers have made mention to anything concerning a napkin or cloth wrapped around Jesus' head. But now, after the coming of that second angel, the book now speaks about cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' head that is now off and laying in a place by itself. So evidently that what was wrong with Jesus, the reason why he didn't rise on up in the first place is that there was something wrong with his head. That he stood for they saw the linen cloth back in old Luke. But now here in John, not only do you see the linen cloth lying, but also now do you see the napkin that was wrapped around his head rolled off and in a corner. That means that Jesus' head is now clear. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, sir. Tell me, what do you think? Does it, does it look like us? Does it look like us to you? Oh, it does to me. It, it looks like us to me. How about to you, brother? It looks like us. Let me go on. At verse 8. Then went and also the other disciple, which came first to the tomb. And he saw and believed. Now what they saw was that Jesus was not there. Note, and believed now. Believed what? That Jesus has arisen. But why now? Because that napkin is wrapped over here in the corner. 
and the linen cloth that Jesus was wrapped in, it's also off. And they're both lying now in separate places. And this is the only book where you see that. But I want to take you down a little bit further. I'm going to show you something else here in St. John that you see, that you didn't see in St. Luke, St. Mark, or in St. Matthew. Verse 9. For as yet they knew not that the Scripture, they knew not that the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Verse 10. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. See that now? The disciples are gone away again. They didn't see Jesus. They are gone away back to their own home. But Mary, at verse 11, stood without at the sepulchre or the tomb, weeping. Mary is crying there now. She's sorrowing. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb and see it two angels in white. Let's pause right there. Note now, I want you to pay strict attention to this, that only Mary, only Mary here is able to see the angels in the tomb. Now Peter and John ran to the tomb. And John outran Peter, didn't he? And looked into the tomb. But it, he didn't see no angel. Then Peter, stooping down, went into the tomb. But the book does not record that Peter saw any angels. Does it? Take a look back at St. Luke and at St. Mark and at St. Matthews and see who it was in each case that saw the angels. It's kind of strange that only Mary here is able to see the angels. Let me pause for a moment. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad points out in his teachings that when he first saw our Savior, Master Farad Muhammad, that when he first laid eyes on him, what? He knew, who, he knew him at first sight. But no one else knew Master Farad Muhammad. Did nobody understand who that man was? They just said, here's a man teaching, you need to hear it. But did nobody really know who it was they were looking at at the time that he was teaching. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that when he first set eyes on our Savior, he knew him at first sight. Take a look at the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, sir. Who is that? Who is he? What manner of man is this? who in 1930s were able to say, looking at another human being, that you are God. <laughs> On first sight, he believed him to be God. What kind of mind did he have? <laughs> <laughs> Take a look at your mother, our spiritual mother. That's right. Look at her. And before she died, our spiritual mother, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, she said, all of this that you see, all of this big, beautiful nation of this farm will fall to the ground. It will crumble and be nothing. That's what she said. She said, but don't worry. It'll come back up. What did she know? What did she know that the imams don't know? What did she know that the popes don't know? What did the Honorable Elijah Muhammad know that the preachers don't know? What? For what he said, you have seen come to pass. 
heavens. And he said it at a time when the nation was flourishing. He said it'll fall. He said, but don't worry, it'll come back up. And in verse 12, and she, Mary, see it, two angels in white. Now you know what white is. <laughs> Sitting. The one, watch this now. The one at the head and the other at the feet. Where the body of Jesus had lain. That two angels now that Mary is looking at. Mary can see both of them. Mary had no difficulty whatsoever recognizing the angels when Mary saw them. And here in St. John, it is Mary who was looking at two angels that John and that Peter couldn't see or did not see. But Mary is able to see him. Now one of these angels is at the feet where Jesus was laying. And another angel is at the head where Jesus was laying. Now, it's up to you to decide which one was where. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? We don't really have to talk about this, do we? Since we are in unity, we just think. And you know what we're thinking about, don't we? <laughs> Let the others wander over it. Verse 13. And they said unto her, these angels now, both of them are going to talk to her. Woman, why we to stop? In other words, you don't need to cry no more. You can stop crying now. Because <laughs> Jesus' head, the napkin's coming off her. So now when we first stood up that Muslim, you saw him standing, but his head wasn't right. <laughs> But he's getting his head on right today. Yes, Isn't he? Yes, the napkin that's been bound around his head for the last 6,000 years, or for the last 400 years, or for the last 54 years, is now, in this instance, being taken away. As soon as we get his head straight now, you will see him resurrect, won't you? So Mary, the angel is saying to her, there is no need to wait. And in verse 14, and when she had heard, thus she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. She saw him standing. This is the first time in all of the books. St. Matthews, St. Mark, St. Luke, and St. John. In the book of St. John here, it is the first time that any one person outside of the angels have seen Jesus standing somewhere around or about that tomb. And note the time that she, Mary, see him standing there is when his head is unwrapped from this napkin. Now is Jesus standing. And she's supposing him to be the garden, wanted him to tell her where they had taken the Jesus that she was looking for. And Jesus said unto her, Mary, and when he called her name, she recognized him and called him Master. I'd like to pause for the moment, just for the moment. And I'd like for you to read now, here on Message to the Black Man. Come over here by this moment and read page 127 in Message to the Black Man, at the last paragraph. Okay. In some cities, we convert five to one woman. The so-called Negroes should unite and put a stop to the destruction of their women by the serpent.
the woman in Revelations 12 and 4 actually refers to the last apostle of God and her child refers to his followers or the entire Negro race as they are called who are not ready to be delivered to go to their own. Stop. Hear what she said? This is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad writing back in 1965. He said, I know you are Jesus, but you are not yet ready to be delivered. In 1965, you were already a nation of Islam. You were already standing, and he could look out there at you and see you looking like a Muslim, but he knew that you were not. For he said of his own words right here in the book and to many of you personally that all he was trying to do was get a little of the dirt off of you. He said clearly here that you are not yet ready to be delivered. Yes, you are standing, but your head is not straight yet. Yes, that you are not ready yet to go on and to become that Jesus the resurrection of that God, the resurrection of that Allah, you have not yet reclaimed your own, have not come back to the knowledge of yourself, and know that this scripture, this Bible, is talking nothing but about yourselves, that you are Allah. This Jesus here that's being resurrected, that all you need to do is start to practice truth and right conduct amongst yourselves. And you would see and know it. And Honorable Elijah Muhammad knew that you were not doing it. And for that reason, he was able to say unequivocally that you are not yet ready to be delivered. How did he know that? What was he reading? Who was talking to him? In verse 17, in the book of St. John, chapter 28, Mary goes over towards Jesus to touch him. And Jesus in verse 17 saith unto her touch me not for I am not yet ascended to my father but go to my brethren and say unto them I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and to your God for at the time that Mary first saw Jesus in the eyes of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad looking out upon you, you were not ready yet to go unto your father. Go and be as your father is. A sin in eminence mentally to that moral place in the mind where built God resides. Inside of that truth that's within you inside of that righteousness that's within you you had not yet ascended to that state so this Jesus told Mary touch me not for not yet have I ascended and have become clean yet and that's all that's being talked about for you as long as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was alive though you were standing you were not yet clean yet not a clean Muslim, not the kind of Muslim that is prophesied for you to become. Today is the time and the moment when it is up on you, a duty, a requirement to ascend unto your father and to my father, for we have the same father, to ascend unto your God and unto my God, for your God and my God is the same God. And that's the same God that was in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And the same God was in our Savior, Master Farad Muhammad. And that God is spoken of in the Quran, chapter 20, verse 6. 
I, Allah, am the truth. The truth that lives within you. I don't need to go any further, do I? Let me stop here. We still got another two weeks. Assalamu alaikum.